My name is Jeremy Walton, and this is the cinematography of Oppenheimer. Let's go! We are back again with another cinematography video. Just got back from watching the movie Oppenheimer, directed by Christopher Nolan and cinematography by Hoyt Van Hoytema. If you're into movies, then you already know a lot about this film, or at least heard about IMAX black and white film or the practical effects. I'm surprised there wasn't more information about certain topics, but I'll cover as much as I can. We're gonna start with the IMAX cameras used for this film. That's something they're heavily promoting, which makes sense. We know Christopher Nolan is a fan of film, and IMAX cameras are his preferred choice. The one you've probably seen many times is the MSM 9802 IMAX camera, and for Oppenheimer, they shot IMAX whenever possible for optimal resolution and immersion. These cameras shoot 15 per format using 65 millimeter large format film. This can be considered 18K, not your typical film camera or anything like your digital camera. We complain about size with our mirrorless cameras or cinema cameras, but IMAX cameras are a different beast altogether. Let's jump over to IMDb real quick and go to the details. Here's a bunch of info, but we're talking about this camera right here, among others, and lenses that I will get to. When talking about the size of the cameras, Hoyt Van Hoytema kept it pretty simple. Yes, it's heavy, but it's perfectly manageable. We were not doing long takes, and I only had the IMAX camera on my shoulder in short bursts. Plus, I had a rock-solid crew with whom I have worked on many films before. This does add to some of the challenges when shooting IMAX, but I'll save that for later. The real spectacle is the actual film they use for these cameras. Instead of choosing and reading specs for digital cameras, we have the film stock, which is not like your typical 35mm film. Here's a diagram that shows the difference between formats, and you can see how much bigger the IMAX format is compared to 35mm. It's over 8 times as large. Just to give you some context, since you probably own a mirrorless camera, here is my Canon R3, a digital camera with a 36 by 24 millimeter full frame sensor. Bigger than 35 millimeter, much smaller than IMAX. Make sure you don't get confused when you see something like filmed for IMAX with certified digital cameras compared to what Nolan did for Oppenheimer. There's a difference. There's a lot of videos on this topic already if you want to check it out, but yeah, this could be simplified hopefully in the future. Now we know Christopher Nolan loves film, but here's what his cinematographer has to say about it. Although I shoot a lot of commercials using digital cameras, I still believe film is more engaging to watch and is much closer to the human visual experience. After watching Oppenheimer, yeah, it's something special and we're seeing. There's still nothing that beats the resolution, depth, color, and roundness of the analog image, nor in the feeling overall that film conveys. When you watch an analog print, especially in an IMAX theater, the level of impact is freaking inspiring. Besides color, they also used black and white film throughout the movie. The reason for the black and white was very much a way of separating those two narratives, so that on an intuitive level, you could easily jump from one to the other. This was something I really enjoyed. I'm always a fan of how filmmakers visually tell stories from cameras, lenses, and even color. I don't want to spoil anything, but the black and white was used appropriately. Based on what was going on, there were two sides or a divide that black and white really represented. Think about that when you watch the movie. For these scenes, they had to create something that didn't exist, which was the black and white film itself. It was a gutsy choice. One of my very first phone calls was to Kodak, inquiring if they had any 65mm large format black and white film stock, but they had never made that before, and early on it was uncertain as to whether they would or could achieve it in time for this production. This is what I love about filmmaking. They had a problem and had to figure out a solution to tell their story. I know being Christopher Nolan, you have a lot more options than the average filmmaker, but you know, he started with his film following with a low budget and had to get creative. So whether you have an iPhone, mirrorless camera, whatever, as filmmakers, we solve problems. And for Christopher Nolan, he's still doing that. After they reached out to Kodak, they got to work, and before you know it, they supplied us with prototypal film stock, freshly manufactured with handwritten labels on it. And when we tested it, the first time we saw it, it just blew us away. It was so special and so beautiful. This was Kodak's double X black and white negative film, 5222, and unfamiliar to everyone. So it was a collaboration between Kodak, IMAX, Panavision, and Photochem, who did the film processing in Los Angeles. We now have the cameras and film stock, but we also need lenses. Before I get into that, we have to understand the look they were going for, which matters when you're choosing lenses. When I think IMAX, I remember sitting in the theater watching Dunkirk, and the shots of the planes flying over the ocean were just... I was in awe of it. It's shots like this where IMAX shines, and I can see why you'd want to film it this way. In our previous films, the emphasis was on the action, but for this film, he wanted a very simple, unadorned style to the photography, especially on faces to support the unfolding psychological drama. 
Interesting, we have this drama that has a different focus than past films. My biggest technical challenge with shooting this film in large format was managing the myriad of close-ups while keeping the faces interesting and appealing and making the end result feel intimate and psychologically powerful. We have another challenge, and if you watch the trailer or seen the movie, the face of Oppenheimer really stands out. I think this is a really good representation of what film can do, and this is done countless times in the film. This wasn't an accident. They talked about it, planned for it, and executed. In the case of Oppenheimer, it's a story of great scope and great scale and great span. But I also wanted the audience to be in the rooms where everything happened, as if you were there having conversations with these scientists in these important moments. The close-up also came up multiple times during interviews. You do a shot like that and everybody feels the weight. We tried some different things. I worked with some bounces. I moved some negative around and somehow all our feelings culminate and all are working together shake hands at that moment. The reason I bring all this up is because IMAX isn't known for the close-up and that made the choices for lenses challenging. On IMAX cameras, Hoyt Van Hoytema described the sweet spot being around the 50mm to 80mm range and describing anything wider becoming more fisheye and if you go too long the image becomes flat and compressed. The 50mm has become our wide lens, the 80mm our tighter lens. On close-ups they give you the right proximity and wideness and everything around starts to function like the peripheral vision of your eyes. One problem Problem is they needed to get closer to the actors because the faces were now the landscape of the film. Hasselblad, Panavision Sphero 65, and Panavision System 65 lenses were adapted so the filmmakers could get close for greater intimacy thanks to Panavision lens specialist Dan Sasaki. Dan is an amazing lens artist, a magician who met what I thought were impossible demands as he tweaked existing lenses or re-engineered others from the ground up. Yes, I know, something not all filmmakers have access to, but that shouldn't stop you from thinking outside the box. You may have noticed some focus issues, if you want to call them that, if you've seen the film. There's a particular way Nolan shoots, which gives actors more freedom, but may make it harder for a first AC. This may be something you didn't even notice. I bring it up because at times, they were filming in low light situations and shot at a T1.4 instead of a T4. We should cover lighting as well, but this is the one area that had limited information, so it'll be quick. They use tungsten to 18K HMIs, and even the airy sky panels. It a little bit of everything and they really enjoyed LED lighting. Hoyt Van Hoytema praised the color rendering and controllability of LED lights, especially the no latency wireless controls. He also mentioned the scene when Oppenheimer was at his hearing. All the lights came from outside the windows. They were able to adjust and match the daylight in real time, which was a much quicker way to work. I wish I had more for you, but that's all I got for lighting. As for visual effects or lack thereof, or who knows because this area is a little gray. As with our previous films, I also knew early on that he wanted to shoot as much as possible in camera, utilizing practical effects and miniatures as much as possible, keeping CGI, blue screen, and visual effects to an absolute minimum. Sounds great, but they really didn't explain how the explosion was done. For now, they're keeping it a secret. We just have to fill in the blanks. The actual explosion was mind blowing. The sound design was on point for that. I was really curious how they were going to show it, and I think it works. We might be inclined to have preconceived notions of what the explosion might look like from past films or documentaries, but this had its own feel, its own way that went along with the story being told. There was a great explanation why they didn't want to use CGI for the Trinity test. It tends to feel safe, even if it's impressive and beautiful. It's difficult to make you feel danger, and we were presenting the ultimate danger. We needed it to feel threatening, nasty, and frightening to the audience. And in case you were wondering, since no one likes to use practical effects, no, they didn't detonate a real atomic bomb. You know, someone had to ask. So what did they do? Unfortunately, there's no behind the scenes footage, but this was the best explanation I could find. We created science experiments. We built aquariums with power in it. We dropped silver particles in it. We had molded metallic balloons, which were lit up from the inside. We had things slamming and smashing into one another, such as ping pong balls, or just had objects spinning. That should give you some idea of what they did and utilizing long and short shutter speeds with an array of exposures to create those impressive images. All of this reminded me of the 2011 film Tree of Life, directed by Terrence Malick and cinematography by Emmanuel Lubisky. Some of the imagery for Tree of Life could have been done with CGI, but like Nolan, Terrence Malick wanted something completely organic. You'll just have to check out the film, but when asked about creating the visuals, does this sound familiar? We worked with chemicals, paint, fluorescent dyes, smoke, liquids, carbon dioxide, flares, spin dishes, fluid dynamics, lighting, and high-speed photography to see how effective they might be. 
I've heard something similar, and just look at these images from the Tree of Life. It was 12 years ago, but this was the first thing that popped to my head when I heard how the Trinity test was shot. Maybe they were influenced, or maybe not. As a filmmaker though, it's always good to know, understand, have this hard drive of knowledge stashed in your head because you never know when you'll need it. I really wish they spoke more about the editing of Oppenheimer that was done by Jennifer Lame. This was another piece of the film that I think could have hurt the film, especially with a runtime of three hours. So far, nothing. Not much about the post workflow either. A little disappointed. I really hope we get an interview with her and to hear her approach, the challenges, workflow. There's a lot to unpack, and I think she deserves it. If something pops up before I post this video, I'll link it below. The last thing I want to cover is the future of IMAX, which we can see some pros and cons with Oppenheimer. We talked about the 9802 IMAX cameras, but we should expect a fleet of new IMAX cameras coming soon, said the IMAX CEO. We are developing and deploying at least four new state of the art film cameras over the next two years growing the existing fleet of film cameras by 50%, with the first new camera being put into use by late 2023. Shooting with the new IMAX cameras that are quieter and more user-friendly might push directors to use the format more often, but IMAX also comes with a cost. Being more expensive, everything is usually bigger, less takes or shorter length of takes, etc. So what they come out with will be a major factor in who will actually use those cameras. The other issue is the projectors themselves. Only 30 theaters worldwide were able to screen the movie with the true IMAX 1570 projectors. That makes me think, no one wants to use IMAX cameras because he wants that experience for the moviegoer. But how many people get to actually see it the way he wants you to? That's a big ask for such a small percent of people based on the theaters that have the right projectors. Not to mention using a 600 pound, 11 mile long reel. And there has been some projectors that have had issues in the middle of a showing. That can't happen if we want people to come back to theaters. But we are thinking about more opportunities regarding this. For instance, building new 70 millimeter projectors and branding other 70 millimeter projectors with IMAX. We are aggressively searching for more opportunities in that regard. To me, it seems like we're in this middle ground of trying to push film or IMAX film, which some people say is dead, but we don't have the infrastructure to support it, like theaters and projectors, and in the case of Oppenheimer, didn't have black and white film. On the other hand, we have digital films or cameras that are everywhere, but not quite up to par with IMAX film yet. And I say that because we know how fast paced technology is, and it's only a matter of time before we have 18K cameras or something in that realm of technology. It's interesting to see this balance and where it goes, or ultimately, who wins? A lot at stake and too many factors in that battle for this video. The takeaway, if you love movies, if you love the theater experience, if you want to support film or films in general, go watch Oppenheimer. Well, there you have it, the cinematography of Oppenheimer. Hope you enjoyed the video. Hit that like button because there's definitely more on the way. Subscribe so you don't miss out. Leave a comment if you have questions. Until next time, it's a wrap.